talk to you about something I find really exciting, and that is other planets in our galaxy. We have discovered thousands of other planets out there in other solar systems, and most of them are really different from our home planet. A lot of them are extremely hot, and others are extremely cold, and only a few of them, really a small fraction, is located at just the right distance to their own sun so that they have a moderate temperature. This is what we call the habitable zone around a star. And it's where water can be present in liquid form on the planetary surface. This is the basic prerequisite for life as we know it. So I want to take you on a journey to three star systems and we'll take a look at what planets and their habitable zones might look like. We'll start a journey here on Earth, and as you all know, it is a habitable planet. And uh, as you also know, we haven't been treating our own planet particularly well lately. It's almost as if we're try trying to turn it into an inhabitable planet. So let's just say we actually managed to do that, right? We messed it all up. We made it inhabitable. We can't stay here. We actually have to go out and find ourselves a new home. So what do we do? Let's say we have a spaceship. It's really fast. It can travel at the fastest speed possible, which is the speed of light. So we get in, we all get in, we switch on the engine, we start, and phew, we fly past the moon after just one second. And after eight minutes, we fly by the sun, and then we leave the solar system. Our first destination is the star Proxima Centauri. It's our closest neighbor in space, the nearest star to us. And even though it's our closest neighbor and we're traveling at the fastest speed possible, it will take us roughly four years to get there, because space is pretty damn big. So when we arrive there, we find out, hey, we're really lucky, there actually is a planet in the habitable zone. And when we land there, it might look something like this. We see that there's a dim red sun in the sky, and we land on the surface, and when we look around and we actually happen to see something like a tree, we might notice that all the leaves are black because the plants have to gather all the light that impinges upon them. They can't just be green, they have to be black to absorb all the light they get. Now, we'll notice something else that's very different from our home. We will notice that this planet is what we astrophysicists call tidally locked. That means it always faces the same side to its sun. And that means we have one half of the planet that has eternal day, and we have another half that is eternal night. And where we might want to set up camp and try to stay there for a while is that rim around it where we have eternal sunrise or eternal sunset, if you like that better. So this is a pretty exotic and fascinating view that we have. However, we might notice that there's something that makes our life there really tough. And the reason for that is, that suns, like our own sun, or also Proxima Centauri, they are not these nice, steady light sources that they look like when we view them with the naked eye. Actually, when we look at our own sun up close, like this, you see that there are these spots on the surface, these bright spots. And what you also see for our sun is, it's flickering, it's moving. We see really hot plasma doing its intricate dance among the magnetic fields on the solar surface. And sometimes we see bright flashes happening. These we call flares. And they emit lots of high energy photons, x-rays, lots of charged particles. And this is only what our good old quiet sun does. For something like Proxima Centauri, we know that these flares are much more violent. There will be huge magnetic loops. There will be huge eruptions of the stellar surface. And this is really bad news for us on our little planet there, because these violent flares and the particles coming out from the star might strip away the atmosphere of the little planet. Well, that's bad for us, right? We'd like something to breathe. So, what we have to do is actually, we have to get back into our spaceship and we have to keep traveling and find ourselves a better place to live. Now, let's go for something else that's exotic but also really fascinating. Let's go for an exomoon. 
An exomoon is a moon that circles around a planet in another solar system. Let's go for a moon that circles around a massive planet, something like our own Jupiter or Saturn. When we land on that tiny moon, we don't have just the sun in the sky, we also have a big planet in the sky. It's a fantastic view if you imagine that, right? Now, what we also might notice with our giant planet hanging there is that we have northern lights on such a planet. And now, this is not an artist's impression. This is real photographic data from our own solar system. This is our Saturn, and there are actual northern lights on it that were imaged with another telescope there. Fantastic. Imagine having that in your sky all the time. It's great, isn't it? And now, this is good news, because not only are the northern lights beautiful, they also mean that the giant planet has a magnetic field. And such a magnetic field can shield us, can be a guard against the negative effects that flares from the sun can have on us. So if we're here with our tiny exomoon, somewhere here, we are shielded by that magnetic field, and our atmosphere will not be stripped away, as in the case of Proxima Centauri. So that's great. Um, but something else that we might notice is, if our moon is not in a perfectly circular orbit, what will happen is that the gravitational force from that massive planet there will squeeze and squish the interior of our moon. And if you squeeze and squish the interior of the moon or of the planet, you get something, and that is volcanoes. Now, volcanoes are pretty awesome. It's, it's a really cool thing to look at, right? But it won't be just any old volcano like we have on Earth. It's going to be massively large volcanoes. So what I'm going to show you again is a real picture from our own solar system, from one of Jupiter's moons. And you will see a massive volcanic eruption here on the rim. This is, this is really intense, because what you see there is 150 kilometers high. Imagine that. 150 kilometers. Now, you don't want to live next to a volcano that produces a 150-kilometer-large ash cloud. You don't want that, right? So you might say, hey, you know what? We're going to live somewhere here. That's, that's all right, right? No, it's not. Tough luck, because that's another volcanic eruption going on here. So being on such an exomoon is maybe not such a great idea for us to live there, to stay there, to build a life there. So with a heavy heart, even though we have this beautiful outlook on the giant planet, we get back into our spaceship. And this time, we might actually aim for something that is a bit more familiar. The exotic places are great, but this time let's aim for something that's really similar to a solar system. We are looking for something that we as astrophysicists call a solar twin. This is a star that has pretty much the same mass and temperature as our own sun. And there are a few of those around. Actually, to get to the closest one to us, we have to travel for around about 40 years in our super-fast spaceship. But, well, we'll make it. We'll, we'll get there after 40 years. And let's say we really have a lot of luck, and there is actually something like an Earth-sized planet in a somewhat Earth-like orbit. And what we're really hoping for is, of course, something like this when we get closer, right? We want to see something that actually has oceans, that has water. But, if that planet that we see there is in an orbit that's only 3% smaller than our Earth's orbit, what we might rather see is something like this. A planet that's completely shrouded in acid clouds. And below those clouds of acid, there's a barren surface more than 400 degrees hot. So how do we know this? Well, this is actually Venus from our own solar system. It doesn't take much to turn something that might have become an Earth into something like Venus. It's just a few percent change in orbit. And now there we are, right? We traveled all this distance, we looked at all these fantastic places, and still we haven't found a place to live. So what does this mean for us? There are a lot of planets out there in our galaxy. Actually, we know that on average, there's one planet per star out there. So that's really, really a lot of planets, right? And there will be a few of those that will be like Earth. But none of them is just around the corner. There's no second home for us near to us. So here's what I want us to do. Here's what I want all of us to do. I want us to keep reaching for the stars but to take good care of our planet at the same time. 
Let's not mess it up. Thank you.